Happy Saturday, everybody. This week on the show, we talked about the 1517 evil May Day riots, and we mentioned at the end of the episode that riots among London's apprentices became something of a tradition in early modern London. And here's the episode where we've talked a little bit more about that. It is our February 2016 episode on the Body House Riots of 1668. Enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Uh, Possibly the weirdest thing that I've ever learned on this podcast, and that includes (laughs) having done a podcast about people who turned into soap after they died. In early modern London, when apprentices had a holiday... The thing to do was to go knock over some brothels. Like that's not, not still knock- a thing, right? No, <laughs> and it, I don't mean knock over like uh like slang for robbing them. I mean knock over like literally pull them down. And today we're going to talk about one such riot, and it took place during Easter week of 1668. Although this particular riot was a lot bigger and a lot more complicated than just the normal apprentices having a day off. <laughs> tearing down some brothels, which was a thing that they like to do. So heads up, today's podcast is not explicit, and we are not going to talk about what goes on in a body house. But yes, parents and teachers, body house means what you think it means. So today's show is maybe not for the youngest of the listeners. So as Tracy just suggested, lots of people rioted at London's brothels in 1668, not just apprentices. But apprentices are cited again and again as making up the bulk of the crowd in this story. So we're going to take a moment to shed some light on who these young people, nearly all of them young men, were. For a few hundred years in England, apprenticeship was a seven-year indenture that combined both work and instruction. And originally, people had been apprenticed to the master of a guild. This came with quite a bit of prestige and was kind of a systematized uh, organization for apprenticeship. But by the 17th century, when we're talking about today, London's guild system was really in decline. And that meant that the apprentice system was showing some strain as well. What had been a really prestigious appointment directly with the master of a guild was instead moving closer and closer to just flat-out unpaid servitude that did not come with many advantages. And this is probably why, by the mid-1600s, a lot of people were were quitting their apprenticeships after two or three years, even though they hadn't really finished. You can look at charts of the average of how long people stayed in their posts and There's a precipitous decline between year three and four. If people had the opportunity to get out of their apprenticeship, they did. Although people came from all over England to apprentice in London, most of London's apprentices were from the surrounding area. The farther away you got from London, the fewer people went to London to be apprenticed. And most of the apprentices were from relatively affluent families, at least ones who either had or could borrow enough money to make an initial payment to a master in exchange for taking their son on as an apprentice. Once that money was paid and the apprenticeship actually began, though, apprentices usually did not make any money of their own because they were being paid in instruction and experience, not in wages. This is sort of an extreme version of the unpaid internship. They also had very few freedoms. They needed their master's permission to marry, to socialize, to go to the theater, to go to a tavern, basically anything fun. In 1660, the average age of an apprentice was 17 or 18. So with all that in mind, it may be a little less surprising that a popular pastime among London's 17th century apprentices was the brothel riot. On holidays, particularly Shrove Tuesday, which is the last Tuesday before Lent, apprentices frequently wrecked London's brothels. Between 1606 and 1641, there were 24 Shrove Tuesday brothel riots that we know about. That's 24 full-scale riots in 35 years. Uh, And in case the name Shrove Tuesday doesn't ring a bell, folks might know it better as Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras. Yay! (laughs) Yeah, uh, it's observed or celebrated in a lot of different ways all over the world, but Shrove Tuesday is is what people were mostly calling it in, in England at this time. 
During a brothel riot, rioters would use tools like staves and bars to literally pull down buildings, and this naturally caused a lot of property damage, and it displaced anybody who had been living or working inside the damaged or destroyed structures. And regardless of what your personal feelings are about brothels, a lot of times these are people who did not have any other option for supporting themselves, so they would be out of work and homeless after the riot. And in spite of their popularity in terms of having a a pretty consistent customer base, brothels were not popular from a religious or social standpoint. Plenty of people visited brothels, but plenty of people thought brothels were a sinful scourge on London. Sometimes these worked out to be the exact same people. Because brothels, in spite of their popularity, were viewed as seedy and immoral, the apprentices who tore them down didn't usually get a lot of harsh punishment. They would see a small fine and a short imprisonment, if anything. The general consensus was that apprentices were doing a good thing by destroying the city's brothels. So when it came to this Shrove Tuesday rioting tradition, English political writer James Harrington called it an, quote, ancient administration of justice at Shrovetide. The 1668 riot, on the other hand, was exceptional. It was much, much bigger, and instead of happening at Shrove Tuesday before Lent, it happened on Easter Monday after Lent was over, and it lasted for three days. The property damage was much greater, and the perpetrators faced much, much harsher punishments, even harsher than might be expected by the increase in the size of the riot. And we're going to talk about the 1668 riot with more specificity after we pause for a brief word from one of our fantastic sponsors. On Easter Monday, 1668, which fell on March 23rd of that year, rioters armed with simple weapons like poleaxes, staves, and iron bars started pulling down the brothels in Poplar in London's East End. And yes, fans of Call the the Midwife, that's the same Poplar where that show is set. According to historical accounts, these rioters were apprentices. They probably included other people, too, though. Poplar was home to lots of sailors, and many of them were currently at home without a lot to occupy their time, having been recently released from service after the end of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, which went on from 1665 to 1667. The first brothel to be struck belonged to Damaris Page, who was known as, quote, the Great Bod of the Seamen, by which we mean men who work on the sea or sailors, not the other possible interpretation. Regardless, these rioters organized themselves into regiments. Each one had its own captain and its co- its own colors. Green was particularly popular. One of those captains was named Peter Messenger, which is why sometimes these riots are referred to as the Messenger Riots. On Tuesday, similarly armed rioters spread through London, targeting the districts where the city's highest concentrations of body houses were located. At least 500 people were involved in this second day of rioting and pulling down buildings. This is when the Crown got involved to try to maintain order. A letter to the Lord Mayor and Lieutenancy of the city was sent in the name of King Charles II, ordering the watch to be doubled and for two companies of militia to be mustered to suppress the riot. Famed London diarist Samuel Pepys wrote about it in his diary for the day of March 24th. At Whitehall, he said there was, quote, Great talk of the tumult on the other end of the town about more fields among the prentices taking the liberty of these holy days to pull down body houses. And Lord, to see the apprehensions which this did give to all people at court, that presently order was given for all the soldiers, horse and foot, to be in arms, and forthwith alarms were beat by drum and trumpet through Westminster and all to their colors and to horse as if the French were coming into town. I remember reading a lot of Peep's diary in, like, a literature class. I feel like they left out all the funny parts. I do, too, because I did the same. And it wasn't until much later in life where I was like, there's good stuff in there that's really entertaining. This bit in particular made me laugh every the whole time I was typing it in there. Tuesday's riots led to arrests, and some of the rioters laid siege to Finsbury Jail, where they believed their compatriots were being held. They did not actually find any other rioters in the jail, though, but four unrelated persons did manage to escape in all the chaos. The rioters were more successful in their goals at the new prison in Clerkenwell, which 
did have some of the arrested rioters being held there, and they were broken out. Peeps also went out with his friends to see the riots in action on Tuesday. But they mostly found lots and lots of soldiers and people who were vexed that the soldiers were going after the apprentices. He repeats a couple of times in his Tuesday diary entry, overhearing people say, quote, it was only for pulling down the body houses. He also notes that this whole event apparently perplexed King Charles II. If the body houses were such a scourge on London, so much so that people supported pulling them down, then again, from the Peeps diary, the question, quote, why, why do they go to them then? As a side note, uh, I mean, we established earlier in the podcast that this Shrove Tuesday brothel riot was a kind of a tradition. So why would King Charles II be so perplexed? Uh, A lot of those riots had happened either before he was born or while he was in exile in France after the beheading of his father, Charles I. So it's possible that he this was the first time he had really experienced firsthand or uh, heard in more detail about this idea of the London body house riot. I like that he um, can't see and grasp the two-faced nature of humanity in many cases. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, Chuck, come on. You have a conversation with Charles II about the duality (laughs) of mankind. Uh, Then, on Wednesday, a very large group of rioters, the exact numbers are unclear, but it was probably in the thousands, continued to attack brothels around more fields. The rioters started threatening to pull the palace at Whitehall down and chanted things like, quote, we've been the servants, now we'll be the masters. And another rallying cry was, reformation and reducement. All of this rioting continued to vex the crown and the court at Whitehall. Pepys wrote about Wednesday's riots in his diary as well, and here's what he wrote, quote, the Duke of York and all with him this morning were full of talk of the prentices who are not yet put down, though the guards and militia of the town have been in arms all night and the night before, and the prentices have made fools of them, sometimes by running from them and flinging stones at them. Some blood hath been spilt, but a great many houses pulled down, and among others, the Duke of York was mighty merry at that of Damaris Pages, the great bawd of the seamen. And the Duke of York complained merrily that he hath lost two tenants by their houses being pulled down, who paid him for their wine licenses 15 pounds a year. So just to recap, the Duke of York is upset that his tenants, the bawds, who pay him for wine licenses, have been displaced by this rioting. (laughs) But not really concerned about them, just his income. Uh Yes. Uh, It was on Wednesday. The inconvenience and loss of income to himself. Yeah. It was on Wednesday that the militia, guards, and even the king's lifeguard dispersed the rioters and arrested many of the apparent ringleaders. Happening concurrently with the last two days of this riot were the publications of a couple of pieces of satirical writing. We don't actually know who wrote them or whether they were the work of the rioters or not. We don't really have a sense of whether the people writing these satirical things were uh, working with the rioters or opposed to them or exactly what, in terms of the rioters themselves, uh, was going on. We can't accurately say whether these particular writings reflected the views of the rioters, but they definitely were reflecting the views of some people alive at the time who were involved in all of this. So they shed some light on sort of what people were thinking out in London. The first, which was presented in the form of a petition, was known as the Poor Whores Petition. It was purportedly drafted by the displaced bods whose brothels had been pulled down, and it came out on March 25th, which was the Wednesday of the riot. It lampooned both the women who worked in the body houses and Lady Castlemaine, or more properly, Barbara Villiers, Duchess of Cleveland, who was the notorious and married mistress of Charles II. This faux petition was highly critical of both the king and his mistress, but it also contained a plea to Lady Castlemaine that she would try to protect all these displaced women from the body houses. After all, goes the logic of this writing, you are one of us, Lady Castlemaine. The two satirical writings that followed were both in the form of a letter from Lady Castlemaine back to the displaced bods. They're identical except for the first paragraph, and they go on to lampoon both Lady Castlemaine and the Anglican Church. 
There's a lot of criticism wo- uh, woven into both the petition and the response. They criticized Charles II for keeping the mistress. They criticized Lady Castlemaine for being Catholic. They criticized the Catholic Church for earning an income from taxes on brothels. And they criticized the Archbishop of Canterbury for purportedly keeping a mistress of his own. And it's these same themes of religion and hypocrisy that may help to explain why this particular riot got so very big and why the response to it was so much bigger. And we're going to talk about all that after we pause for a brief word from one of our fantastic sponsors. While London's previous Shrove Tuesday brothel riots had been punished with what was basically a slap on the wrist, The 1668 riots ended with a great many people being brought to trial. It's unclear exactly how many people were prosecuted for participating in the riot. Only 77 of those who wound up in court were actually identified uh, by name, either in the records or historians having put all the pieces together since then. But very little is known even about them. Fifteen ultimately were indicted for high treason. Damaris Page turned state's witness during the trial, with the court being very careful to avoid mentioning precisely what her job was, so that she would appear credible in the account she gave of destruction of her property. And many of the other women who had worked in the destroyed body houses, on the other hand, wound up being prosecuted in the aftermath of the riot. In a punishment that was acknowledged by the high court and other people surrounding the case as just incongruously harsh, four of the men who were convicted of high treason were hanged, drawn, and quartered. This was by far the most extreme punishment allowed under the most severe interpretation of the law. It was far, far greater than how body house riots had typically been handled in England. There are lots of possible explanations for exactly why the crackdown on this specific riot was so extreme. One, described in a 1986 paper on uh, in the Historical Journal, is by Dr. Tim Harris, then at Emanuel College, Cambridge, and now at Brown. And his interpretation, basically, is that the riot itself was more about dissatisfaction with the Restoration than it really was about the brothels, and that the rioters were so harshly treated because of that political and religious undertone. So an extraordinarily brief recap of the Restoration. When Charles II's father was executed in 1649, Oliver Cromwell came to power, at which point England became a republic. Charles II fled to the continent, and Cromwell remained in power until his death in 1658. Then in 1660, Charles II ascended to the throne, at which point the monarchy was restored. That's the Restoration. There are entire books about the Restoration, and there was a whole lot more that went on behind the scenes than what we just said. So that is an extremely quick summary for those of you who don't remember or never learned that. In a lot of historical accounts, the general description of the Restoration was that London was really, really in favor of Charles II's return. There had been demonstrations against the army and in favor of Charles as the monarch in the years before the Restoration actually took place. Some of that uh, agitation was as much about religion as it was about the monarch. Some of the people who were pressing for Charles II's return to England were hoping that he would allow a greater degree of freedom of religion— the religions that diverged in some way from Anglican teachings, like Presbyterians, Quakers, Baptists, Methodists, and Unitarians, among others, were all branded as dissenting or nonconformist religions. Many of London's apprentices were adherents to one of these nonconforming denominations. Instead, in 1660, Charles II, still in exile, issued the Declaration of Breda, which was one of the last steps before he was restored to the throne. He wrote this statement. Quote, and because the passion and uncharitableness of the times have produced several opinions in religion by which men are engaged in parties and animosities against each other, which, when they shall hereafter unite in a freedom of conversation, will be composed or better understood, we do declare a liberty to tender consciences and that no man shall be disquieted or called in question for differences of opinion in matters of religion, which do not disturb the peace of the kingdom, and that we shall be ready to consent to such an act of parliament as, upon mature deliberation, shall be offered to us for the full granting that indulgence. In other words, people would have freedom of religion provided that their opinions did not, quote, disturb the peace of the kingdom. And among those opinions, apparently disturbing the peace of the kingdom, were various nonconformists. 
Quakers and Baptists in particular frequently wound up in court on charges of, quote, attendance at a nonconformist conventicle. Harris also cites this as the reason why this huge riot took place after Easter instead of on Shrove Tuesday, as had been so common in prior years. Even though the Declaration of Breda hadn't really allowed the nonconformists the practice of their religion, uh, freely at least, there had been a period of relative laxity in terms of the enforcement of religious conformity. The Great Plague of London in 1665 and the Great Fire of London in 1666 had both given Parliament plenty of other things to worry about, and some of the laws governing religion had lapsed. But in 1667 and 1668, bills that would have allowed Presbyterians religious freedom started circulating in Parliament. The House of Commons was really deeply opposed to these, though, and the proclamation on the matter that Charles II ultimately signed on March 10th, 1668, during Lent, less than two weeks before the riot began, was instead about enforcing obedience to the existing laws, not about allowing greater religious freedom. This also circles back around to those satirical petitions and letters that we talked about before the break. One of their themes, England was willing to tolerate brothels, but not religious nonconformity, which seems awfully hypocritical. Some of the chants and rallying cries that they used during the riot, like the ones that were about uh, Reformation, also have a lot more religious tone to them than being about wanting to strike down the sinfulness of a brothel. Uh, running parallel to this crackdown on religious nonconformity was also a crackdown on theaters in London, and a running theme in this increasing criticism of theater was that theaters were no better than brothels. And there was a lot of just hateful rhetoric that was used in all of this. So this stoked dislike and disdain for both the brothels and the theaters. And as we said at the top of the show, London was full of sailors that were recently released from service, as well as overworked and mostly penniless apprentices whose system of apprenticeship was quickly disintegrating. So there's some degree of supposition and drawing of conclusions in all of this, uh, some degree of interpretation of what people's motives might have been. Men, there's no smoking gun. None of the rioters left a journal saying, I'm really upset about my religious freedoms, and so how about in the guise of a brothel riot, I make that demonstration? Like, there's nothing documenting any kind of thought presses like that. And there are also no court documents It's explicitly saying that the rioters were being persecuted because of religious nonconformity, uh, although it does seem like there was some fear that people who were dissenting in some way were also going to work with uh, Cromwell's existing supporters who were still around to try to overthrow the monarchy. So, like a lot of events in history, this one was definitely a confluence of a ton of different factors and influences without one clear single explanation that just explains the motives of everyone involved at the same time. Oh, history, you're never simple. Yeah, I wish I could remember <laughs> where... I wish I could remember where I stumbled across just the words, uh, the brothel ride of 1668. Like, I was doing work on something completely unrelated last week, and then the that's, that series of words was on my screen somewhere. And I went, well, okay, we got to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> and and then I fortunately was able to find enough information to talk about that. And then when I tried to reset, retrace my steps to figure out where I had originally seen reference to it, I could not find it. So I don't remember. But that's the brothel riot. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com and you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 